Good evening, everybody. Welcome. We just wanted to um, remind you to hit share if you're watching this live, please. And that way other people can see. We're really enjoying seeing uh, lots of people watch and get to um, learn more about the Lord. It's a great thing. One of the few benefits of the time we're having right now. Also, uh, if you are watching this live right now, could you just take a minute and make a comment and let us know how you're doing. We'd love to hear that. Father God, we thank you so much for uh, all that you are doing in our midst. Uh, Lord, we just love to see how you are reaching the hearts of people. And uh, pray that you might use us in that way, God. We just ask that you would somehow give us opportunities to speak your truth into the lives of people who we love and who... Uh, don't know you or who have maybe walked away. And so, Lord, we know that you can use a time like this for that purpose. And so we just give you permission to put those opportunities in front of us. Pray that you give us wisdom and boldness in that. And Lord, tonight we just desire to uh, give you our heart for this bit of time, our full attention, and uh, just soak you in a little bit. Yes, to know. 
Good evening, everyone. Welcome. We're glad that you're with us, and uh, we thank you for following us for a while from your homes and wherever you're watching the broadcast, and we're continuing to learn how to do this and to try to do it better and better each time. Thank you for the advice on adjusting the sound and, you know, making things uh, better for this broadcast. You know, we've, we've heard from a lot of people already, and we're just a few weeks into this quarantine that we're kind of all ready for things to return to normal. We miss each other. We want life to go on. We want to be with each other once again and to be able to have the freedom to go and do the things that we're used to doing. And, and I get that. Uh, and it makes me think of uh, Joseph of the Old Testament when he was sold off into slavery and how quickly his life changed. And it was never the same again. And then eventually Joseph ended up in prison being falsely accused for something that he didn't do and didn't deserve to go to prison for. But the Bible says that he was in there for a good couple of years. And I can't help but wonder how many times he sat down and just asked the Lord, how much longer is this going to go on? And he was patient and he was faithful to the Lord. And we can do the same. You know, it may be another few weeks. This may go on for a little bit longer. But be faithful to the Lord. Keep your eyes on Jesus and just watch for all the things that he's doing. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 14 tonight. The title of the message is Abram Rescues Lot. And we've been talking about Lot for a little while now, discussing the fact that he really wasn't supposed to be there in the first place, and he's going to become a burden to Abram. Well, tonight the story reveals to us just how much of a burden he became and how much he's reaping for the things that he has sown. And let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. Lord, uh, it's just so great to be able to in the midst of trials and tribulations that we can just keep our focus on your word and it is living and powerful and it just speaks to us right where we are. Lord, I thank you for the people in our congregation that are providing devotionals that we can put out every couple of days to minister to the body, that we can continue to take care of one another and look out for each other. And in the day and age that we live in with this technology where we can still reach the body of Christ and reach so many people who, are, who don't have a church home right now. And so, Lord, we thank you that the stories just continue to pour in, that people are connecting with us and connecting to these online teachings who've never been here before and who are now looking because they're fearful of the days that we live in. And so we thank you, Lord, for answering our prayer and grabbing the hold of the heart of America and bringing it back to you. We pray that you would continue to do so. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Genesis chapter 14. We're not going to cover the whole chapter tonight, but we're going to see Abram have to rescue Lot. Let's review the story just a little bit so we understand where we're going with this this evening. We remember that Abram had been exiled from Egypt by the Pharaoh, and so he and all of his people and his wealth and his livestock exit the nation. They, they reach southern Canaan before they start to settle down and figure out what's next. And uh, we remember that Abram goes back to Bethel to worship the Lord. Well, we also remember that Lot is with him. And so Lot and all of his wealth and all of his people and all of his livestock are on the move. They're still attached to one another. They come back into the southern part of the land of Canaan. And uh, you just got to picture that as a massive operation of moving all those people and that stuff and that livestock out of Egypt and back up to Canaan. 
We've been talking for a little while about how Abram in chapter 10, or I'm sorry, chapter 12, when he flees to Egypt, it's something of a picture of the backsliding believers, something like the prodigal son, the parable that Jesus told us. It is much like that. And how Abram should not have been in that place. He had done so well when he was in the land of promise. He thrived spiritually. His testimony was excellent. He ministered and he proclaimed the name of God in a foreign pagan land. And he really did well. But when he fled down to Egypt, he's much like the prodigal son. I'll just take all my stuff and I'll just go and, and live the way I want to. And he didn't do well when he was down in Egypt. His return to Canaan is then much like the picture of the prodigal son and the story that Jesus told when he comes to his senses and he comes back to his father. And so Abram leaves Egypt and he comes back to where he's supposed to be. We watch specifically that once Abram had settled back into the land of Canaan and gathered himself, he goes right back to the place called Bethel where he had previously built an altar and worshiped the Lord. And once again, he, he takes up that practice. He's back in the spirit. He's returned. He's restored. And in that place of Bethel, as uh, we, we find out in the scripture that this mobile ranching operation between Lot and Abram is just so massive that they're having trouble staying together. They look around and they think, well, there's just not enough in this place to sustain all of us. Our herdsmen are now arguing over territory and where to feed and where to water and whose sheep are whose, and whose camels are whose, and, and whose Mercedes belong to who, and those kinds of things. And so it's time for them to separate. And Abram proposes, let's separate, which should have happened a long time ago. But he finally came to his senses and realized this was the thing that was needed. He allows Lot, why don't you look around, you take the first choice, I'll go the opposite direction, whatever you choose. And we see in the scripture that Lot chooses by lifting his eyes upon the land. And he's looking for nothing more than the greenest place that is, has the most water and the most grass to feed his flocks, to make them fat and to breed well and to make him that much more wealthy. And we saw that he was a picture of carnality, of just looking with the lust of the eyes. He didn't stop to talk to the Lord. He didn't pray. He didn't ask for counsel. He didn't even take it up with Abram. He just reviewed the land of the Jordan north of the Dead Sea and said, that's what I want. And off he goes. So Lot leaves, and in that moment that Lot separated from him, God begins to speak to Abram once again, proving that Lot shouldn't have been there in the first place and showing us that sometimes we need to become separate from that which, which drags us down or keeps us from being faithful to the Lord. And so when God speaks, he allows Abram to understand the full context of the covenant that he's making with him. He firms up those terms he now awards the terms of the covenant to Abram, and he says, now you lift your eyes and look around. And everything that Abram can see from the hilltop that he's on in the hill country of Judah, uh, he, God says, it's all yours. Forget the lustful choice of one little green valley. I'm giving you and your descendants everything. And so because Abram was faithful to the Lord, because he came back to him, he was restored to him, he's awarded everything. By the end of the chapter, we saw Lot drifting towards the very evil city filled with very evil men. That's Sodom. That's to the south of Canaan. And Abram, at the same time, is free to wander around to see everything that the Lord is going to give to his descendants. And so he does. He goes on the move. He checks everything out. He comes back to this place called Hebron that is straight west of the Dead Sea. It's in the hill country of the future tribe of Judah. And so we move on tonight into chapter 14, just a portion of it. And I want to warn you that much of the text that we're going to read tonight is terribly difficult to read because of names, places, and the context of this. But we'll read through it. I'll come back and I'll give you the layman's version, the easy story of what just happened. But let's begin, verses 1 through 10. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Chedor Laomer, king of Elam. We'll just stop there for a second and make this easy. This guy, Chedor Laomer, is one of the main characters tonight. His name shows up multiple times. And so I'm going to simplify this. From now on, his name is King Cheddar Eater. And that's how we'll remember him. He loves cheddar cheese. So, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, 
Shinab, king of Adma, Shemaber, king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these joined together in the valley of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Cheddar Eater, and in the, 19th, or the 13th year they rebelled. In the 14th year, Cheddar Eater and the kings that were with him came and attacked Rephaim in Ashtaroth Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim of Shava Kirathaim, and the Horites in the mountain of Seir as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and attacked all the country of the Amalekites and the Amorites who dwelt in Hamazon Tamar. This is this hard, isn't it? This is tough stuff. Verse 8. And the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, went out and joined together in the valley, in the valley of Sidim against Cheddar Eater, king of Elam, Tidal, king of nations, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now, the valley of Sidim was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. And so let's talk about what's happening here, and we'll try to simplify this as we go along to understand what this battle was all about and who was who and what these places are. But let's start with this. After the flood of Noah, we watched a pattern or an advancement take place in human society. And what I mean by that is, is several weeks ago we talked about how after Noah, as the populations of the earth began to really grow again, we saw the establishment and the movement of human society from a family to a village or maybe a tribe to a village to a city. And then we started to see what was happening when cities began to grow across the landscape, that those cities had leaders within them, kings who began to make alliances or confederacies with one another in order to protect each other, trade people and trade good and take advantage of the, the population in an area, as long as you've got an alliance of peace, you've got some power over the area that you rule over. And so that was taking place. That went on until we saw Babylon become the first one in Scripture after the flood to become a kingdom that was pushing or forcing its cult practices upon a very large area. And that's when God stepped in and confused the language and spread the people all over. So here's where we stand. The pattern is repeating itself. Now the human population is once again growing across the landscape. We're about 400 years after the flood, and we see this advancement once again taking place. And so what we just read is confederacies of kings of city-states in areas that have gone to war with each other. And to break it down very simply, what you just heard was the story of a very infant Persia coming into the, the little city-states, each with their kings around the Dead Sea of Israel, attacking those cities, turning them into vassal city-states, which means that they are subjective to that Persian confederacy, and they're paying tribute to them. They're paying money to stay alive, effectively. So here's what probably just happened. The, the Bible just told us that King Cheddar Eater and the four other kings who were with him from Persia all came down to the Dead Sea. It's not their territory, but they wanted more. And they attacked all these small city-states, each with their kings. They put these people into subjection, and they kept them there successfully for 12 years. The Persians invading the Dead Sea, putting the Canaanites into subjection. It was successful for 12 years, but in the 13th year, what happened was that a confederacy formed of the Dead Sea kings, and they decided, we're going to go in on this together. We are going to stop paying tribute to stay alive to King Cheddar Eater and the infant nation of the Persians. Probably what happened was that most of this had taken place before Lot settled in Sodom. Most likely, when Abram and Lot came out of Egypt back into the land of Canaan, that Lot chose to settle in Sodom at about the 13th year when no tribute was being paid. To him, walking into that place, it would have appeared as if this was a free city, a place that owes no one anything, 
a place that's at peace and at rest with itself. It's got a good confederacy going of the cities around it. And Lot said, this is great. I like this. These are a free people. I can choose to do what I want here. I can live with these people. So he enters in in the 13th year. And in the 14th year, after King Cheddar Eater has, has noticed, we're not getting any tribute for an entire year out of these people we have put into subjection. He says, it's time to do something about it. And he comes to attack them. Now, here's what's interesting about this. When archaeologists went through this area, there is one archaeologist specifically named, his name is Nelson Gluick. He found in a number of these ancient cities and the remains, he found the destruction layer that was dated exactly to the time of Abram that we are looking at. And what he was showing in a number of these places that were dug up and in this specific destruction layer is that a number of these cities, these people groups that are named here in the Bible in chapter 14 of Genesis, that when the infant nation of Persia, the confederacy of those kings came in and attacked those city states, some of them were completely wiped out. They never recovered. Some of those cities lay dormant for about 400 years before people started to come back and build on those again. And some of them, like the Bible says, went through the process of being subjected to become a vassal state to the Persian Empire, or the, the birth of the Persian Empire, and uh, they continued on, but in a much weaker way for 12 years. And so Lot has chosen to go to this place called Sodom. It's one of the cities that survived that, and the attack comes again because they want their money, the, the infant Persians do. And so what happened is, is these four Persian kings that banded together came back to their territory that they thought they owned that had rebelled against them. And this confederacy of Dead Sea kings comes together in a group of five and they go out to make war with King Cheddar Eater and the people that he's with. The place that they gather says is full of asphalt pits, which is so interesting because that's an, an ancient glimpse into the Middle East's oil reserves that we are now tapping into and have for some time. It says that there was uh, oil fields bubbling to the surface of the land in those asphalt pits. And I couldn't help but think when I was thinking what that was like is I was picturing a sandy flat place where the fighting was going on and you've got these black pits just bubbling up these dangerous traps. And, and I remembered what my face used to look like when I was about 16 years old. It just pockmarked and pitted all over it. <laughs> Most of us went through that, but I thought, well, that's not such a fun place to go to and try to battle. I, I didn't win that battle very well myself, but here's what happened. When you've got sticky black pits of death all over the landscape, like what's being described here, it doesn't make for a very good battlefield when the confusion and the chaos starts up. And it didn't work well for the confederacy of the five Dead Sea Kings. Two of them are said to have fled almost immediately. Sodom and Gomorrah are named. They went back home. We're done with this. We've got people falling on the battlefield. We've got people getting stuck in these pits. We're out of here, and they took off to go home. That left a coalition or a confederacy of three who ended up having to flee out to the mountains, which brings us to the point where the confederacy of the Persian kings has totally won this thing. It was an easy route for them, and here's the thing that we're going to see coming next if your confederacy comes down into the Dead Sea Kings to make battle with them and they end up running away, they haven't paid their tribute for the last year, what are you going to do now? And the answer is pretty clear. You easily walk right into each one of those city-states and you do whatever it takes to subject them to pay tribute once again. And so what that means in these ancient days is these victorious Persian kings were going to go to each one of these cities one by one, take their people, take their stuff, take their goods, their wealth, and go on back home with brand new slaves, people that you can force into your military. You leave just enough people within that city who are scared of you, enough to keep the city running and produce some valuable goods, but not enough people to defend themselves. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Verses 11 through 12. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. And so in Sodom and Gomorrah, that's exactly what happened. The victors came in for the spoils. 
They hadn't been paid tribute in an entire year. They were angry. They wanted these city-states back under subjection and to pay tribute to them once again. So Lot got caught up in it. Why? Because out of the lust of his heart and his eyes, he went and settled in Sodom in the first place. Lot most likely was of military age. He was incredibly wealthy with people and livestock and goods. When he and Abram were together, they caught the attention of Pharaoh in Egypt. Imagine that. The Pharaoh of the entire nation started wooing Abram's supposed sister because he thought this was going to be a great alliance that we could have together. I need access to your livestock and your wealth. I'll give you a place to live. Things like that. He caught the attention of the, uh, of the Pharaoh of that entire nation when he comes back into the land around the Dead Sea. He's got so much stuff that he has caught the attention of the kings of Persia, and now they have taken him. They want to keep him in check. They want to own everything that is his. Now think about this for a second. What a great asset Lot became to the Persian kings. Because he was carnal, he was not an asset to the man of God. Catch this. The scripture has showed us clearly that there was contention between Lot and his herdsmen and Abram and his herdsmen. He was not an asset to the man of God, but he was an asset to the enemy. How sad a testimony is that? That we could fall into that position. The kings of Persia didn't have to go any farther into the landscape around the Dead Sea to own Lot and his stuff. He brought it to them. You see, and that's the picture of a backsliding believer who takes his stuff, like the picture of the prodigal son, and he takes it right into enemy territory and makes it available to become an asset of the enemy. We're finding Lot reaping what he has sown. He reaped in the flesh. He is now sowing in the flesh. Charles Spurgeon simply commented on it this way. He said, those believers who conform to the world must expect to suffer for it. And have we not all, like Lot, tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Have we not all gone to our own Shechem and our Bethel and built an altar there to worship the Lord and called upon his name in an enemy's territory? We were loud and proud about our faith, identifying ourselves as Christians, saying, I belong to him, I will be faithful to him. And have we not all, at some point afterwards, looked over at the pasture on the other side, the greener one, and longed for it, figuring it was going to be a better option. And it happens, doesn't it? And here's why. If we pull the truth off of this, and we see what's really happened here, the analogy is this. The pasture of surrender, the pasture of humility, the pasture of righteousness and obedience to the Lord is often the most barren and challenging pasture that we can find ourselves in. And it's that way because God often tests our faith to prove who we are. And so when we're in this barren pasture of obedience, we often, like Lot, will look across the way and say, Man, it's really green over there. That is such a good choice to be in that place. And with the lust of our eyes, we take off and we say, I don't want to be in this barren, difficult pasture any longer. This is too tough. I don't like it. It's not the obvious choice. This is very challenging. And we try to go somewhere else. But God is challenging us. And we see, we remember just a few weeks ago when we were looking at the Beatitudes of Jesus in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 6, I believe, that Jesus made this principle very clear in one point when he talked about these things. He said, blessed are you who hunger now, the barren pasture of obedience now. He said, you shall be filled later. And Lot has done the exact opposite. He looked at the green pastures around the Jordan Valley, <clears throat> just north of the Dead Sea, and he said, I want to be filled now. I'm a believer who wants the good stuff now, which Jesus promised will come with emptiness later or a lack of rewards. 
<clears throat> and so we understand what's taken place here. We see Lot continuing to live a carnal life. He sowed and now he is reaped. And guess what's going to happen next? There's a pattern being repeated. And I hope I can communicate this well tonight. It's not so obvious, but here's what I see in this. Prior to the flood, God had desired to have total influence over the affairs of mankind, that his creation would be obedient to him. And it didn't happen that way. So God judged the earth with a flood. He left eight people to remain alive. When they got off of the boat at the end of that flood, God made a covenant with Noah and his sons. And in one of the details of the covenant was this, that mankind would now have to look over the affairs of other men. In other words, God was instituting for the first time the biblical sense of human government. And it's almost as if God said at that point, I tried to, to be in control of your affairs. I tried to have you follow me in these things and be obedient and you didn't do it. So now you get to watch over each other. And in the same pattern, God had to rescue Abram out of Egypt. And it's almost as if he's saying now, I did that once. Now, Abram, you get to rescue Lot. 13 through 17. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Honor, and they were allies with Abram. Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. I'm going to go back and read verse 14 again. We just got an enormous glimpse into the holdings of Abram. Now, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house, and he went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Cheddar Eater and the kings who were with him. And so, <clears throat> when Abram had settled in Hebron, he apparently made alliances with the local tribal leaders. These would be Canaanite tribes, Canaanite family groups. And he enters into these uh, alliances there is one specific who's mentioned here is looks like to be the head of all the rest of them. His name is Mamre, the Amorite, and his brothers with him. And you know, we've talked about this before, but this kind of thing would be very common in this day and age if you had people groups unrelated trying to live in proximity with each other. And so if different people groups had the ability to make war, they would offer enter into these alliances to create a broader scope of protection for all. This would allow the opportunity for trade between these groups, allow for the opportunity for worship practices to go back and forth between these groups. And one of the big things that this was necessary for, this provided access to unrelated people to trade for marriages. And so Abram in the proximity of Hebron makes alliances with these Canaanite peoples. But you'll notice for the first time in the Bible that the word Hebrew shows up and it's given as a title or a reference specifically to Abram, which in this context is telling us that Abram is the recognized head of a clan or a tribe. And it should be that way because we also just read that Abram has 318 men who are of fighting age who are specifically trained for this purpose among the people that travel and live with him. It's also told us that these were men who were born in his own household. So they are the product of slaves or employees that were born in the time that Abram was serving with his father. He inherited his father's stuff. And now Abram has been tracking through Canaan into Egypt. And all of these people were born into his household and have reached this age where they've been trained to be men of war. Now, I want you to stop and think about that for a second. Because oftentimes the paintings 
that we see of Abram show the man and his wife and his one maidservant who produces a son for him just living in a small tent out in the wilderness and there's nobody else around. But that's not what we're seeing in the Bible describing to us. If Abram had 300 men who fit this narrow category, how many people do you suppose are in his employment that aren't mentioned? Other men that don't fit this category, women and children. And so what the text is telling us is that Abram is literally a mobile empire in the land of Canaan who has garnered the interest of not only the Pharaoh of Egypt, but when he comes to Hebron, the tribes who are in that place, those Canaanites have said, my gosh, this man could make war with us if he wanted to. Let's enter into a peace agreement. It's an enormous operation that he has. Huge, 318 men who are capable of making war. Now I wanna stop for a minute. I've got something I wanna to talk to you about and I am going to burst your bubble tonight about Abram. I'm gonna give you something to think about, to realize about this man that you've probably never heard before, but we can pick this up out of the text that we are looking at. It makes total sense and I think we can support this biblically, but here's, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about this and then we're gonna follow the pursuit of the infant nation of Persia. We kind of tend to think of the, of the fathers of the faith typically as men who have their flaws, but I think most of us, when we picture guys like Moses and Abram, we're probably all picturing the same thing and that's the grandfatherly type that has reached an old age. He's got a large beard. He's a very kind and godly and righteous person. He's got rosy cheeks. And when you just look at him, you think, oh gosh, I just, I'd love to see, spend some time with that person on Christmas. I'd like for him to be my grandfather. And he would never hurt a fly. He's just so warm and welcoming and, and he just represents the picture of God to us. And, and don't we do that when we picture God the Father sitting, sitting on his throne? Most of us picture a kind older man with a large beard. He's powerful, but he's a warm, loving God, the kind of the kind of nature that we would just want to crawl up on his throne on his lap and just let him love us and spend time with him. But here's the truth. When we start pulling out the entire context of what we're looking at in Abram's life and who he is, especially at this point, that Abram is in a region and a time that was dominated by warlords, that Abram can go toe to toe and live just like them. I'm not gonna outright call him a warlord, but when it comes right down to it, when he enters into the territory of Canaan, he settles in Hebron for a short period of time. There are other warlords, other kings of cities, of small city-states and heads of tribes that have the ability to make war just like Abram does, and they choose to enter into an alliance with him. We're watching right now Abram choose to get up and to go to war to rescue his brother, his nephew Lot. So here's the thing. I'm not going to call him a warlord, but he walks like a duck. He talks like a duck. He even smells like a duck. And that makes him have the same ability to carry out what these warlords in this territory could do. So let's make use of this. I wanna briefly encourage the men who are listening tonight because we have gotten ourselves into a situation in this country where our culture, our American culture, which is often eventually accepted and imitated by the American church, where anything masculine seems to be frowned upon. Anything that is generally or traditionally considered, this is what a man is like, is now frowned upon. It's not wanted. We've reached the point in our culture where, where anything masculine like this is demeaned. It's called an unproductive holdover of the caveman days. I don't know if you've noticed this, but many men these days refuse to even try to hold a door open for a lady as she's coming in or out of a business or a house because they're too afraid to show anything that might communicate a difference between the sexes, a superiority or that somebody might actually need help or be shown some kind of a kindness. 
But here's what we found in the record of Abram. He's a mixed bag, and this isn't the only attribute that he has. Let me read to you what I've discovered. He was a man called to surrender to his God, to obey his God. Abram is a builder of altars in the land of pagans. He was to be a gentle and chivalrous leader to his wife. He was to be willing to separate from a brother who's in sin and when necessary to put on his warlord face paint and go rescue that brother when his sins have resulted in a slavery. Christian masculinity isn't just toughness, football, and shotguns. It is everything that Abram is. He has all of these qualities in great quantities. Men, the warlord uniform isn't the only one that you're going to wear. It may not be the uniform that you even wear the most. But when it comes right down to it and you're called to get into the fight to rescue somebody to do what's right, put on the face paint and as Abram has demonstrated, wear that uniform loudly until the job is done. Abram is God's man. And often being that man has many aspects to it. Think about Jesus. He's typically described as being meek. The word is not weak. The word is meek. It typically is defined in the illustration of a powerful and speedy racehorse under control. And Jesus often demonstrated that meekness. However, like Abram, Jesus wasn't afraid to put on his warlord face paint, go into his father's house and set things straight because there were slaves in that place that needed to be set free. People were coming to worship the Lord. They were being taken advantage of by the hypocritical money changers. And Jesus went in there with a whip and flipped the tables over. And Abram is demonstrating something very similar. Men, being a man is not a sin. It's not. And on occasion... Letting a man be a man of God means that you allow him to go fight for what's right, to be righteous, a godly righteous. So now that we've gotten that taken care of, let's finish up by tracking Abram's dedication to this fight, and it is impressive. Here's what happens. Abram and his 318 trained servants and the men of his ally, Mamre the Amorite, pursue this very successful and victorious coalition of Persian kings. And, and remember this as we go on and we look at this. As he pursues them, the last fight that took place was against, was between five Dead Sea kings and four Persian kings. And the four Persian kings won this very easily. In fact, when they're on their way back home, to the land of Persia, their numbers have grown. And I know this because they went in and took the people out of these cities that they conquered. They have already likely forced many of these men into their own military, which is an increase in their numbers. When Abram takes them on and he starts to pursue them, he has his ally near Hebron and his brothers and their people. So we're basically looking at Two kings going against a coalition of five who've grown in numbers. And they flee from him. The coalition pers the, pursues the Persians north as far as Dan, which is at the northern border of the future lands of Israel, 140 miles away from Hebron. He chases them 140 miles. And then the battle starts in the city of Dan. When Abram and his coalition arrive, they split up their military into different groups and they start attacking by night, likely attacking the city of Dan from different directions, different rotations of soldiers so that they can keep the battle going on 24 hours a day to get what they came for. And here's what's interesting, if you like facts. The original gates of the city of Dan from the time of Abram have been exposed by archaeologists. And if you go to Israel... Well, you can't right now. But if you go to Israel and take the tour, you typically go to the city of Dan and you can see the remnants of those city gates and stand there and imagine if they could tell stories what those remnants would have to say about the battle on this night when Abram himself was there, when the infant nation of Persia 
was inside of that city and the battle was raging. And Abram's men were knocking on all of those city gates, trying to get those Persians to come out and to release all the people that they had taken captive. So there in Dan, the battle goes on. The Persian kings and their people flee. It says that they go all the way up to Damascus, Syria, with Abram and his men pursuing after them. That's another 140 miles north. I'm sorry, another 100 miles north of the city of Dan. And thus, the man of God, the warlord of righteousness, not only worshiped God in enemy territory, but catch this, because he was obedient to the Lord, because he worshiped the Lord, because he wasn't afraid to put on his warlord face paint and go and do what was right, he not only entered Canaan, which was enemy territory, and proclaimed the name of the Lord, he went into his enemy's enemy's territory, and he rescued Lot and everyone that had been taken. He brings back Lot's people, Lot's goods, and as we will find next week, he even brings back everyone that was taken from the city of Sodom. So here's the exciting picture for us tonight, and we'll close with this. When we suit up and show up and obey God, when we pursue righteousness, when we fight when it's necessary, an entire population of sinners who've fallen into slavery can be set free to pursue after righteousness. And with that, we start to see the picture of Jesus in Abram. Because this is what Jesus did for us. We were in slavery to our sin. We were lost. There was only one who could set us free. Abram did it for Lot. Jesus did it for us. He paid the price and he set us free. He was obedient to his father. He pursued after righteousness and holiness. And in the end, because of his victory, we get to come home. And let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. Lord, we thank you for this powerful lesson that we have discovered. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit would encourage the men who are listening to this message and maybe going back to take a second look at this scripture to see where they fit in with this. And to discover that when it came down to it, that Abram was called to many aspects in his relationship with the Lord. There's a great amount of submission and humility and surrender to the Lord. But when it comes down to it, and he's called into the battlefield, Abram wasn't afraid to do so. So Father, help us as men of God to be men who pursue after righteousness and to be willing to stand up and to pursue after and to fight for what is right, that we would not stand down in the culture that we live in, that we would not be feminized, that we would not be illegitimate, whatever that word is when it comes to our masculinity. Lord, that we wouldn't abuse it, but we would use it for righteousness. So help us to step up to the plate, put our paint on, and go and do what's right. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. We have two more services this week. We will be here on Friday evening for a Good Friday service. We're going to walk right through the last 24 hours of Jesus' life before he hangs upon the cross and finally says it is finished. And then on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, that Good Friday service will be at 6.30. And on Sunday morning, we will be here broadcasting to two churches simultaneously with two pastors sharing the hope of the resurrection of Christ.